Museum digitalized their exhibits. What that has to do with colonialism, racism, or sexism is what Lukas Fuchsgruber will talk to us about in his talk, which in a somewhat provocative way is called How Can We Prevent the Digital Museum or Stop It? In a research compound, he is researching at the Technical University of Berlin about ethical questions of digitalization in museums. And his hypothesis is that the preservation of the digital legacy becomes a farce and that the prerogative of interpretation is relevant in the digital space as well. And we are welcoming him with a virtual applause. Lucas, the stream is yours. Yes, my name is Lukas Fuchsgruber and I work at the Technical University of Berlin about aspects of digital digitalization in the museum. And this talk was prepared by me for this CCC event. It is directed at the critical digital scene. So what are we going to talk about? The topic are digital museums, and that is various things. For one thing, digitalized collections, objects in museums that are photographed, scanned, but also the digitalized documentation. So the archive information about objects which are digitalized and that are turned into metadata. And it will be about digital communication or presentation of objects and the metadata. And the focus will be the scene that is listening and museum employees. So let's start with museums in lockdown. In the corona crisis, locations had to close down, including museums, of course, and the focus very quickly turned to social media formats and their digital offerings. And an often used hashtag was closed but open. So the museums are closed, but they're still open. The Austrian journalist didn't get the name, summarized it very nicely the way it felt to her, and I quote, in my Instagram feed, for the first time I have a man in a suit explaining art to me, end quote. Another image of museums in lockdown that I found very telling were DJs in museums. Another popular image, and we see a DJ here, in front of the dinosaur skeleton in the Berlin Museum of Natural Science, which was taken from Tanzania, a German colony at the time, to Berlin. Back to lockdown. What was the feel at, during lockdown? Empty museums, of course. Digital formats that were often used were the Google Arts and Culture uh, projects from 10 years ago, when Google had 360-degree cameras, which they let go through the museums, and you could click through those and look at those images. So a kind of doubling of a duplication of the museum. You couldn't touch, you couldn't contribute. It's void of people, a very traditional image of a museum or concept. Looking back to this old project, when Google was very influential concerning digitalization in museums, a critical reminder could be that this should not be repeated in this way. We shouldn't let the large tech corporations control how museums for themselves, because as we know, Google is trading in data and we shouldn't uh, gift any more data to them. The lockdown, which is what I'm going to, that, which is my conclusion of this at the beginning, is something that gives us a new perspective on digital, digitalization in museums. We can take stock because of that, because what we see now is nothing that is newly produced. It represents what museums have done in the last few years, and that includes new projects, new funding was available to support new projects. So the Museum 4.0 project was recently extended. That is a 
in uh, the Alliance of Museums that are trying out new projects, virtual reality, artificial intelligence, perhaps. And a lot there is about personalization of your digital visit. So for us, that means at the end of 2020, this is a very good point in time to look at what is happening. Before we talk about the digital samples, specimens, let's talk about the debates, the controversy about museums. They're in the focus, focus of a debate about remembrance culture and new museum, museumology. How is this presented? Who controls what is presented and who is excluded as well? The international uh, museums Council ICOM uh, collected 250 definitions of museums from its members and then started an exchange of what museums are in the in the view of society these days. So from the collection and preservation and presentation aspect, we are approaching formats of participation. And for some people, this definition was too political and too much a reaction to the pressure from social movements. And that is true to some extent, these social movements and, and uh, the progress that is made, of course, is due to pressure from outside. So how can we now have a critical debate about the digital formats? The first example that I'm going to point to is feminist museum critique. The popular group Guerrilla Girls, for example, points to, uh, I, which I've included here, they point to the very few female artists are exhibited, and very often the models that are depicted are female. Now, what does this kind of criticism lead to in museums? If we, if we visit a museum, despite of this criticism, we keep encountering these narratives that you have male artist genius and their female muse that inspires them. One example is Paul Gauguin and his 13-year-old wife, who was married to him in Tahiti. And looking at um, a picture of this 13-year-old wife, I ask myself, how is this story told, the story behind the picture? And in a cultural context, these problematic images are normally decontextualized image files. I have a file that I took from Wikimedia. It has the name of the painter in its title and the title that he gave his work. And the whole pro problematic story is lost. Looking at the museum's website, the museum that owns this picture, you don't even find that picture in their database, so I cannot know how it is presented there. But what I'm going to say is that the file name and the presentation is not neutral. A certain context contextualization would be necessary. And the next example, which we are going to deal with at a bit more length, is the topic of museums and colonialism. So the acquisitions that museums made in colonial times and in a colonial context. And for decades, there have been demands for restitution by local actors who said that the acquisitions made in the colonial context are unjust and uh, the work should be returned to the original places. And a demand that was very important here is the one about archive transparency. So to actually know what museums here actually hold, these lists have to be transparent and accessible because only these lists make it possible to raise demands. And digitalization in museum archives becomes very important here because that is the foundation for such demands. The question, of course, is what can we contribute? These lists are simply scans very often or photographed uh, papers. So as a digital, digital community, we could actually process these lists and enrich them and link data from various sources. And that can be a very practical political act of solidarity. So it's not enough to just wait until museums have uh, 
to take an action, we can contribute something ourselves. I'd like to take a step back and ask how the offerings look that we can see by now. And one example that I'm going to mention are virtual visits. This is a concept by the journalist Kwame Opoku. And in my understanding, this is an interface study. He visits museum websites and looks how easily he can reach information about cultural goods. His example are the bronze, bronze sculptures from Benin in, in Africa. So a large amount of bronze sculptures in the kingdom that, that was looted from the kingdom of, of Benin in the 19th century by the English and that now is in various museums. And his approach is to go to a website of a museum that holds these bronze sculptures and he then tries to find something out, he finds information on, on this and documents what he finds. How easy is it to, to visit the museum digitally and to find the context of these sculptures? And what I'm going to do with you now is to visit the State Museums of Berlin with the intention to find another perspective on the data and the way Delta is dealt with regarding those Benin bronze sculptures. You can see here on the left uh, how I visit the website of the State Museums of the Berlin State Museum and I'm going to the database on that collection, on, of their collection, and I use Benin as a search phrase. And I then wrote down what I've found. So I'm going to read this to you now. One of the 255 works that I can find from Benin in the collection of the Berlin Museum. This is the information I found. We are on the website smb-digital state Berlin State Museums. Prussian Cultural Heritage online database of the collection. The address in the address bar tells us that we are on the interface of eMuseum Plus, so that is a database on collections. What does the actual, the individual object look like or the way it is presented? We have an image on the left of the sculpture, then we have a title, a category, telling us that it is a sculpture, and we see that it, 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 it was conveyed by a company, but how and, and where we do not know, and there is information on the original, which is unclear, and the country Nigeria and the Kingdom of Benin are mentioned. We find measures and an inventory number, which is very, which is very important. So. That is the number which, which, with which the museum has registered the object and the fact that it belongs to the Berlin collection. We also have a copyright remark on the photo. In the photo metadata itself, we have a Creative Commons license, which is kind of contradictory. After these two columns, we have an area further down, which tells us something about Benin in the 16th century and the way it is interpreted visually, what is the facial expression, how that should that be interpreted and the like. And if we click on other bronzes in the collection, the picture is the same. Copyright, Creative Commons, Theodor Franke as the mediator, and uh, no year of acquisition. That made me curious. I wanted to know whether I can see any better documentation. Using the inven inventory number, I can quickly find this object in Wikipedia, and that has a date of acquisition, which is 1901, sadly without a source. But we can add the source later on because I found something else. Also, I can find the signature in the German library, the national library, the digital library. This is a database where scientific institutions feed in their data and other fields from the museum database are to be found here. We have related objects, we have um, a link back to the same platform on the website of the State Museum. And if we click on that, we reach a file on the acquisition, sadly without a scan, 
There is no current image that is all defined on this file. This file cannot be found through the search mask search form on the website. If I enter the inventory number, I can only find the bronze head itself. So the interface is very limited. Only using a detour through half the internet can we find that extra information. But politically, this is very significant difference, very much, because we find a sculpture from the 16th century that Theodor Franke conveyed in the one exhibit, and in the other place we find that this took place a few years after the English uh, mission, punishment mission, and, and um, that is very different information. What we can see here is that the curators of the museums are managing huge amounts of digital copies and uh, digitized documentation, and this is uh, full of uh, imperial uh, liabilities. We should uh, look at this duplication quite critically and ask, um, did anything change about the presentation? And how is the violent history of these um, objects being told? The criticism that I mentioned that is uh, coming from outside museums, where war and uh, colonialism is the context of the uh, acquisition of the objects, has to be shown alongside the objects. And if museums would provide these links, then our role can be uh, to create provisional links, for example, uh, in platforms such as Wikimedia. Another example for present and uh, the future of digitization in museums is uh, the Humboldt Forum, of which you've probably heard. Behind uh, the facade of the uh, Berlin Palace, there's a going to be a, a large museum with an uh, ethnological uh, collection and a, an exhibit on Berlin. And this um, Humboldt Forum contains uh, several digital projects. This ranges from participative production of knowledge with uh, indigenous populations all the way to gamification and personalization. Those are going to be the two examples which I'd like to show you today. The first of these is a project which is called Sharing Knowledge. And it was uh, created before the Humboldt Forum in a Humboldt lab, but it's still being uh, quoted as a prime example in uh, the Humboldt lab. And it wanted to confront existing knowledge in, of, uh, in these collections with a new perspective. And my analysis is as follows. I was only able to analyze this website through screenshots and publications because it's been offline for a while and it is not mirrored anywhere. The project um, took surveys and conducted them locally with the indigenous population. Those were then digitized and presented on a website. And this website was then taken back to these places that uh, didn't have a sufficient internet connection. Whether this knowledge made its way into the uh, databases of the museums, I don't know. If I compare one of these uh, surveys, with the SMB digital database, I have reason to believe that um, these data weren't uh, taken into the databases because you can use the signature to link it back. This external website, which isn't linked to the um, database where these um, data were presented, is unfortunately offline. But still, they're advertising it quite a, ba quite a bit, but we can't um, conduct any kind of virtual visit. Ironically, this project is now more easily available on the ground without an uh, internet connection than uh, it is here. It's a nice example of um, digital exclusion turned on its head.
I'm really curious what's going to happen next if these new critical data are going to be merged with the um, old existing data, but as long as that doesn't happen, we can support it by systematically finding and uh, supporting uh, repository of knowledge and merging and linking these various sources of knowledge critically. The Humboldt Forum had to postpone its opening and a while ago it conducted a digital opening via stream and at this digital opening they presented various other digital formats which I'd like to present to you now. These digital formats are usually conceived of as returning to the physical space through screens, for example. And one of the examples they showed was this um, interactive uh, skull of fish, which is supposed to represent scientific research, but also social interaction. And the project that were presented contained two central layers of presentation. One of these is gamification and personalization, and the other is a digital storytelling. You can, uh, by the way, watch this uh, opening uh, online. Digital storytelling is quick to explain. It's uh, the Humboldt Forum is conducting uh, media work and uh, young and old people are supposed to uh, produce videos for digital empowerment. The next example is a bit more interesting. In an exhibit at the uh, Humboldt Forum, which is called Berlin Global, you can get an, a bracelet which contains a, a chip. And as you walk through the exhibition, it uh, stores certain decisions that you make. The topic of the exhibit is um, Berlin Global, and it um, tells of free freedoms and uh, borders. And if you walk through this exhibit and um, if you've uh, allowed them to track you, then at the end of the exhibit, you'll get a printout of your personal profile. And you're then supposed to meet other people outside the exhibition and um, discuss your results and give them to the archives. And in the way it was made, it reminds me of a different project in the same context of the Humboldt Forum. Uh, which was part of um, the Museum Museum 4.0 program, which is about the digital strategies for the Museum of the Future. And one of the projects here was the Humboldt Cosmos in uh, digital space. Did Museum 4.0 um, is a very interesting example, and it's recently been extended. And this app. The uh, Humboldt Cosmos in Digital Space wants you to find your very own object in physical space, and it has an it, it, there's an app which lets you find your object. It looks a bit like a dating app, and you have to swipe through artworks and tell it if you like them or not. And once the app has collected enough data on you, it sends you to your work of art and uh, in this video the developer um, presents it as a kind of blind date in a museum. What uh, they have in common, these two projects, is a playful visit to a museum uh, that you're supposed to let them track you and get a personalized museum experience. And this way of visiting, of playfully visiting a museum, museum with an app, it, it redefines um, the participation in the museum and the social interaction in a museum. Participation turns into a, into, <laughs> into a kind of Tinder or Grinder that you can walk through. And we see a very strong influence of certain trends in the digital economy of the um, past decade tracking, personalization, gamification. And to me, it's important to have a critical perspective on this or to provide a critical perspective on the politics of uh, digital presentation. 
And um, one uh, reading suggestion is um, the text in the Facebook Aquarium by the Ippolita Collective, where they describe how gamification and personalization technologies um, lead to a certain way of social interaction. If I were to speculate, I would say that the um, history of these projects is the cultural influence of such as Facebook, um, such as Facebook or Google with YouTube over the past decade. And we can see that social media departments in museums are more strongly involved in uh, presentation these days. And so participation in museums is being redefined as social media interaction. This became very obvious during the lockdown where guided tours were conducted um, through Instagram or YouTube and the data servers of these uh, large data trade companies were being uh, used. Um, they have a monopoly. But what we saw in the next step is that this logic of personalization and tracking, which was established by this corporation, is now going back into the museums and being turned into concepts of presentation. What can, uh, what can we do and what can the um, online community uh, do? I think it's most important that we talk about the social internet instead of social media. It's about technical, uh, technical, technological, technological sovereignty, about uh, digital networking and uh, the defense of open standards. So cultural data and objects online need to be linked. We can't simply take what we have and um, then replicate it online, scan it, digitize it in some way, but we also have to link, critically link certain resources. This is not just about colonialism, but also about art and the history of, um, of violence and injustice. And one strategy for us could be to to support more sustainable interfaces such as uh, Wikimedia or Wikipedia. The example of the Humboldt Forum was only meant to show that concrete drafts of, um, a, of a museum of the future exist now. And I would plead to um, look for counter perspective in existing criticism of museum and our contribution could be to link that to um, ethical questions and open standards because otherwise we must be afraid that the digital museum simply um, overtakes um, these debates that we should have. Thank you. We have uh, one question about uh, the context of digitized objects. Can metadata be any an approach to improve these um, these objects? Are they simply not presented on the website? Yes, and that would be a good question to those museums. How much of what they know about the objects do they actually communicate to the outside? The provenance research in the last few decades has, of course, gained importance in museums. And I believe that well, my perspective on this question would be that different places create different kinds of knowledge about objects in the various databases in the Center for Cultural uh, Loss or other centers in different places, countries, up to the knowledge that exists in the original places where these objects come from. And it's not about asking for mandatory fields, but more to say, if we don't have these mandatory fields, couldn't we create places for that same information elsewhere? For example, in Wikipedia, in Wikimedia, could we collect this information there, which is uh, scattered through across the net? So let's not wait for the museums or the perfect technology, but rather get active and act uh, in a solidarity, uh, practice solidarity. 
And would such a digital museum not be a place for an experiment for curate, curating an exhibition completely uh, by swarm intelligence and see what comes out of that? Well, maybe the question is, what does to curate mean these days? Who has control about that? There are many formats for participation and many exhibitions that are conducted using participation, which you could call swarm intelligence. But ultimately, it is about the social interaction that the museum enables, the exchange that it allows. And it's about all parts of a museum, not about just curating, but also documenting. It's about the knowledge that is connected to the museum's collections and what they do in an exhibition. And in the digital area, the thing is that their activity there affects all the other areas much, much more. Uh, databases were curated as well, and that they are so full of liabilities, which could make it a, an exhibition of its own. So to work with that would be very uh, an effective way for the critical public to get interfered. Okay. Who is next question? <coughs> Who drives the digitalization forward? There are there is a funding for research and there are funds for digitization. In the past decade, a lot has happened and a lot of money was provided and um, a lot of prototypes were created. But as to who drives digitization, that's not really answerable for all museums because there are so many of them. So um, that's why I took these large examples in my presentation where several museums uh, cooperate and say that they're, they're developing the presentation of the future or the Humboldt Forum, which is um, experimenting with a lot of digital formats until it's opening next year. So I would like to advertise for, um, for being a critical voice in this exchange. The PAD tells about the about a national infrastructure for research data which wants to define common metadata for objects and somebody says <laughs> the, the, this is very much for for Greek sculptures. Oh no, copies. There is a tradition of copying objects in Rome, where, where many copies were made of Greek sculptures. But there's a question. Um, where, where is the money coming from? Well, there's a lot of money, yes. Um, there are lots of projects that um, want to support digitization. I'm not worried about that at all. But the question is, what are the politics behind this? What programs are behind it? There's a lot of money involved, though. And um, as for the national database of uh, research infrastructure, a lot of discussions and uh, are happening in this uh, in this area at the moment. But if we're if we're going to have uh, common standards of metadata, then I want to know where they come from. So I'm a these uh, data standards that exist in cultural history have a vocabulary from a past of lots of decades ago. Well. These the terms are partly very racist and very problematic, and I'd be very careful about yeah, about um, establishing standards before we've been able to critically analyze them. But if I, 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 otherwise, I think that's a great idea to create standards, and um, if we establish a culture of questioning these old standards. Yes, the internet and thanks you for this beautiful talk, which I would like to add myself, my own thanks to. So there is some covered applause. Thank you for the questions too.